be grateful who cannot run as light as elves. But how are we to get down there even if you've cut through the drift? said Pippin, voicing the thoughts of all the hobbits. Have hope, said Boromir. I am weary, but I still have some strength left, and Aragorn too. We will bear the little folk. The others, no doubt, will make shift to thread the path behind us. Come, Master Peregrine, I will begin with you. He lifted up the hobbit, cling to my back. I shall need my arms, he said and strode forward. Aragorn with Merry came behind. Pippin marveled at his strength, seeing the passage that he already forced with no other tool than his great limbs. Even now, burdened as he was, he was widening the track for those who followed, thrusting the snow aside as he went. They came at length to the great drift. It was flung across the mountain path like a sheer and sudden wall, and its crest, sharp as if shaped with knives, reared up more than twice the height of Boromir. But through the middle a passage had been beaten, rising and falling like a bridge. On the far side, Merry and Pippin were set down, and there they waited with Legolas for the rest of the company to arrive. After a while, Boromir returned carrying Sam. Behind in the narrow but now well-trodden track came Gandalf, leading Bill with Gimli perched among the baggage. Last came Aragorn carrying Frodo. They passed through the lane. But hardly had Frodo touched the ground when with a deep rumble there rolled down a fold of stones and slithering snow. His gravid half blinded the company as they crouched against the cliff. When the air cleared again, they saw that the path was blocked behind them. Enough, enough! cried Gimli. We are departing as quickly as we may! And indeed, with the last stroke, the malice of the mountain seemed to be expended. As if Caradras was satisfied that the invaders had been beaten off and would not dare to return. The threat of snow lifted. The clouds began to break and the light grew broader. As Legolas had reported, they found that the snow became steadily more shallow as they went down, so that even the hobbits could trudge along. Soon they all stood once more on the flat shelf, at the head of the steep slope where they had felt the first flakes of snow the night before. The morning was now far advanced. From the high place they looked back westwards over the lower lands. Far away in the tumble of country that lay at the foot of the mountain was the dell from which they had started to climb the pass. Frodo's legs ached. He was chilled to the bone and hungry, and his head was dizzy, and he thought of the long and painful march downhill. Black specks swam before his eyes. He rubbed them, but the black specks remained. In the distance below him, but still high above the lower foothills, dark dots were circling in the air. <sighs> the birds again, said Aragorn, pointing down. <sighs> that cannot be helped now, said Gandalf. Whether they are good or evil, or have nothing to do with us at all, we must go down at once. Not even on the knees of Caradras will we wait for another nightfall. A cold wind flowed down behind them, as they turned their backs on the Red Horn Gate, and stumbled wearily down the slope. Caradras had defeated them. It was evening, and the grey light was again waning fast when they halted for the night. They were very weary. The mountains were veiled in deepening dusk, and the wind was cold. Gandalf spared them one more mouthful each of the Miruvor of Rivendell. When they had eaten some food, they had called a council. We cannot, of course, go again tonight, he said. The attack on the Red Horn Gate has tired us out, and we must rest here for a while. And then where are we to go? asked Frodo. We still have our journey and our errand before us, answered Gandalf. We have no choice but to go on, or to return to Rivendell. Pippin's face brightened visibly at the mere mention of returning to Rivendell. Merry and Sam looked up hopefully, but Aragorn and Boromir made no sign. Frodo looked troubled. I wish I was back there, he said. But how can I return without the shame, unless there is indeed no other way, and we are already defeated? You are right, Frodo, said Gandalf. To go back is to admit defeat, and to face worse defeat to come. If we go back now, then the ring must remain there. We shall not be able to set it out again. The sooner or later Rivendell will be besieged, and after a brief and bitter time it will be destroyed. The ring raised her deadly enemies, 
but we are only shadows yet of the power and terror that they will possess if the ruling ring was on their master's hand again. Then we must go on if there is a way, said Frodo with a sigh. Sam looked back into the gloom. There is a way that we may attempt, said Gandalf. I thought from the beginning, when I first considered this journey, that we would try it. But it is not a pleasant way, and I have not spoken of it to the company before. Aragorn was against it, until the pass over the mountains had at least been tried. If it is a worse road than the Redhorn Gate, then it must be evil indeed, said Mary. But you had better tell us about it, and let us know of the worst at once. The road that I speak leads to the mines of Moria, said Gandalf. Only Gimli lifted up his head. A smoldering fire was in his eyes. On all the others, a dread fell at the mention of that name. Even to the hobbits, it was a legend of vague fear. The road may lead to Moria, but how can we hope that it will lead through Moria? said Aragorn darkly. It is a name of ill omen, said Boromir. Nor do I see the need to go there. If we cannot cross the mountain, let us journey southward until we come to the Gap of Rohan, where men are friendly to my people, taking the road that I followed on my way hither. Or we might pass by and cross the Eisen into Langstrad and Lebanon, and so come to Gondor from the regions nigh to the sea. Things have changed since you came north, Boromir, answered Gandalf. Did you not hear what I told you of Saruman? With him I may have business of my own ere all is over, but the ring must not come near Isengard, if that can be by any means prevented. The Gap of Rohan is closed to us while we go with the bearer. As for the longer road, we cannot afford the time. We might spend a year in such a journey, and we will pass through many lands that are empty and harborless. Yet they would not be safe. The watchful eyes of both Saruman and the enemy are on them. When you came north, Boromir, you were in the enemy's eyes only one stray wanderer from the south and a matter of small concern to him. His mind was busy with the pursuit of the ring. But you return now as a member of the ring's company, and you are in peril as long as you remain with us. The danger will increase with every league that we go south under the naked sky. Since our open attempt on the mountain pass, our plight has become most desperate, I fear. I see now little hope, if we do not soon vanish from sight for a while and cover our tail. Therefore I advise that we should go neither over the mountains nor around them, but under them. That is a road, at any rate, that the enemy would least expect us to take. We do not know what he expects, said Boromir. We may watch all roads, likely and unlikely, but in that case to enter Moria would be to walk into a trap, hardly better than knocking at the gates of the Dark Tower itself. The name of Moria is Black. You speak of what you do not know when you liken Moria to the stronghold of Sauron, answered Gandalf. I alone of you have ever been to the dungeons of the Dark Lord, and only in his older and lesser dwellings in Dol Guldur. Those who pass the gates of Baradur do not return. But I do not lead you into Moria if there were no hope of coming out again. If there are orcs there, it may prove ill for us, that is true. But most of the orcs of the Misty Mountains were scattered and destroyed in the Battle of the Five Armies. The eels report that orcs are gathering again from afar, but there is hope that Moria is still free. There is even a chance that the dwarves are there, and in some deep hall of its father's Balin son of Hunden may be found. However it may prove, one must tread the path that need chooses. I will tread the path with you, Gandalf, said Gimli. I will go and look into the halls of Durin, whatever may wait there, if you can find the doors that are shut. Good, Gimli, said Gandalf. You encourage me. We will seek the hidden doors together, and we will come through. In the ruins of the dwarves, a dwarf's head will be less easy to bewilder than elves or men or hobbits. Yet it will not be the first time I have been to Moria. I sought there long for Thrain, son of Thror, after he was lost. I passed through, and I came out again alive. I too once passed the Dimbril Gate, said Aragorn quietly. But though I also came out again, this memory is still very evil. I do not wish to enter Moria a second time. And I don't wish to enter it even once, said Pippin. Nor me, muttered Sam. Of course not, said Gandalf. Who would? But the question is, who will follow me if I lead you there? I will, said Gimli eagerly. I will, said Aragorn heavily. 
You followed my lead almost to disaster in the snow, and I have said no word for blame. I will follow your lead now, if this last warning does not move you. It is not of the ring nor of us others that I am thinking now, but of you, Gandalf. And I say to you, if you pass the doors of Moria, beware. I will not go, said Boromir. Not unless the vote of the whole company is against me. What do Legolas and the little folk say? The ring bearer's voice surely should be heard. I do not wish to go to Moria, said Legolas. The hobbit said nothing. Sam looked at Frodo. At last, Frodo spoke. I do not wish to go, he said. But neither do I wish to refuse the advice of Gandalf. I beg that there should be no vote until we have slept on it. Gandalf will get the votes easier in the light of the morning than in this cold below. How the wind howls. At these words, all fell into silent thought. They heard the wind hissing among the rocks and trees and there was a howling and wailing round them in the empty spaces of the night. Suddenly Aragorn leapt to his feet. How the wind howls, he cried. It is howling of wolf voices. The wargs have come to the west of the mountains. Need we wait until morning then, said Gandalf? It is as I said, the hunt is up. Even if we live to see the dawn, who now will wish to journey south by night with the wild wolves on his tail? How far is Moria? asked Boromir. There was a door southwest of Caradas, some fifteen miles as the crow flies, and maybe twenty as the wolf runs, answered Gandalf grimly. Then let us start as soon as the light of tomorrow, if we can. The wolf that one hears is worse than the orc that one fears. True, said Aragorn, loosening his sword in his sheath. But where the wag howls, there also the orc prowls. I wish I'd taken Elrond's advice, muttered Pippin to Sam. I'm no good after all. There is not enough of the breed of Brandoblast to bull roarer in me. These howls freeze my blood. I don't ever remember feeling so wretched. My heart's right down to my toes, Mr. Pippin, said Sam. We aren't it yet, and there are some stout folk here with us. Whatever it may be in store for old Gandalf, I'll wager it isn't a wolf's belly. For their defense, the company climbed on top of the small hill under which they had been sheltering. It was crowned with a knot of old and twisted trees about which lay a broken circle of boulder stones. In the midst of this they lit a fire, for there was no hope that darkness and silence would keep their trail from discovery by the hunting packs. Round the fire they sat, and those that were not on guard dozed uneasily. Poor Bill the Pony trembled and sweated where he stood. The howling of the wolves was now all around them, sometimes nearer and sometimes further off. In the dead of night, many shining eyes were seen peering over the bow of the hill. Some advanced almost to the ring of stones. At a gap in the circle, a great dark wolf shape could be seen, halted, gazing at them. A shuddering howl broke from him, as if he were a captain summoning the, his pack for the assault. Gandalf stood up and strode forward, holding his staff aloft. Listen, Hound of Sauron! He cried. Gandalf is here! Fly if you value your foul skin! I will shrivel you from tail to stout if you come within this ring! The wolf snarled and sprang towards them in a great leap. At that moment there was a sharp twang. Legolas had loosened his bow, and there was a hideous ear, and the leaping shape thudded to the ground. The elvish arrow had pierced his throat. The watching eyes were suddenly extinguished. Gandalf and Aragorn strode forward, but the hill was deserted. The hunting packs had left. All about them the darkness grew silent, and no cry came on the sighing wind. The night was old, and westwards the waning moon was setting, gleaming fitfully through the breaking clouds. Suddenly Frodo started from sleep. Without warning, a storm of howls broke out fierce and wild all about the camp. A great host of wags had gathered silently and now was attacking them from every side at once. Lay fuel on the fire! Sighed Gandalf to the hobbits. Draw your blades! Stand back to back! In the leaping light, as the fresh wood blazed up, Frodo saw many grey shapes spring over the ring of stones. More and more followed. Through the throat of one huge leader, Aragorn passed his sword with a thrust. 
With a great sweep, Boromir hewed the head off another. Beside them, Gimli stood with his stout legs apart, wielding his war axe. The bow of Legolas was singing. In the wavering firelight, Gandalf seemed suddenly to grow. He rose up, a great menacing shape like the monument of some ancient king of stone set upon a hill. Stooping like a cloud, he lifted a burning branch and strode to meet the wolves. They gave back before him. High in the air, he tossed the blazing brand. It flared with a sudden white radiance like lightning, and his voice rolled like thunder. Oh, rugged rough men! Thou done in cow wrath! There was a roar and a crackle, and the tree above him burst into a leaf and bloom of blinding flame. The fire leapt from treetop to treetop. The whole hill was crowned with a dazzling light. The swords and knives of the defenders shone and flickered. The last arrow of Legolas kindled in the air as it flew and plunged burning into the heart of a great wolf chieftain. All the others fled. Slowly the fire died till nothing was left but folding ash and sparks. A bitter smoke curled from above the burned tree stumps and blew darkly from the hill as our first light of dawn came dimly in the sky. Their enemies were routed and did not return. Oh, did I tell you, Mr. Pippin? Said Sam, sheathing his sword. Fools won't get him. Now that's an eye-opener, no mistake. Nearly singed the hair off my head. When the full light of the morning came, no signs of the wolves were to be found. And they looked in vain for the bodies of the dead. No trace of the fight remained, but the charred trees and the arrows of Legolas lying on the hilltop. All were undamaged, save one of which only the point was left. It is as I feared, said Gandalf. These were no ordinary wolves, hunting for food in the wilderness. Let us eat quickly and go. That day the weather changed again, almost as if it was at the command of some power that had no longer any use for snow, since they had retreated from the pass. A power that wished now to have a clear light in which things that moved in the wild could be seen from far away. The wind had been turning through north to northwest during the night, and now it failed. The clouds vanished southwards and the sky was opened, high and blue. As they stood upon the hillside ready to depart, a pale sunlight gleamed over the mountain tops. We must reach the doors before sunset, said Gandalf, or I fear we shall not reach them at all. It is not far, but our path may be winding, for here Aragorn cannot guide us. He has seldom walked in this country and only once have I been under the west wall of Moria, and that wasn't long ago. There it lies, he said, pointing away southeastwards to where the mountain sides fell sheer into the shadow at their feet. In the distance could be dimly seen a line of bare cliffs, and in their midst taller than the rest, one great grey wall. When we left the pass, I led you southwards and not back to our starting point, as some of you may have noticed. It is well that I did so. For now we have several miles less to cross, and haste is needed. Let us go. I do not know which to hope, said Boromir grimly, that Gandalf will find what he seeks, or that coming to the cliff we shall find the gates lost forever. All choices seem ill, and to be caught between wolves and the wall the likeliest chance. Lead on. Gimli now walked ahead by the wizard's side. So eager was he to come to Moria. Together they led the company back towards the mountains. The only road of old to Moria from the west had lain along a course of a stream, the Siranon, that ran out from the feet of the cliffs near where the doors had stood. But either Gandalf was astray, or else the land had changed in recent years, for he did not strike the stream where he looked to find it, only a few miles southward from their start. The morning was passing towards noon. And still the company wandered and scrambled in a barren country of red stones. Nowhere could they see any gleam of water or hear any sound of it. All was bleak and dry. Their hearts sank. They saw no living thing, and not a bird was in the sky. But what the night would bring if it caught them in that lost land, none of them cared to think. Suddenly Gimli, who had pressed on ahead, called back to them. He was standing on a knoll and pointing to the right. Hurrying up, they saw below them a deep and narrow channel. 
It was empty and silent, and hardly a trickle of water flowed among the brown and red stained stones of its bed. But on the near side there was a path, much broken and decayed, that wound its way among the ruined walls and paving stones of an ancient high road. "Ah, here it is at last," said Gandalf. "This is where the stream ran, Siradon, the Gate Stream." they used to call it. But what has happened in the water I cannot guess. It used to be swift and noisy. Come, we must hurry on. We are late. The company were footsore and tired, but they trudged doggedly along the rough and winding track for many miles. The sun turned from a noon and began to go west. After a brief halt and a hasty meal, they went on again. Before them the mountains frowned, but their path lay in a deep trough of land and they could see only the higher shoulders and the far eastward peaks. At length they came to a sharp bend. There the road, which had been veering southwards between the brink of the channel and the steep fall of the land to the left, turned and went due east again. Rounding the corner they saw before them a low cliff, some five fathoms high, with a broken and jagged top. Over it a trickling water dripped, through a wide cleft that seemed to have been carved out by a foal that had once been strong and full. Indeed, things have changed, said Gandalf. There is no mistaking the place. There is all that remains of the stair falls. If I remember it right, there was a flight of steps cut in the rock at this side. But the main road wound away left and climbed with several roots up to the level ground at the top. There used to be a shallow valley beyond the falls right up to the walls of Moria. And the Cyrilon flowed through it with the road beside it. Let us go and see what things are like now. They found the stone steps without difficulty, and Gimli sprang swiftly up them, followed by Gandalf and Frodo. When they reached the top, they saw that they could go no further that way, and the reason for the drying up of the gate stream was revealed. Behind them, the sinking sun filled the cool western sky with glimmering gold. Before them stretched a dark, still lake. Neither sky nor sunset was reflected on its sullen surface. The Cyrenon had been dammed and had filled all the valley. Beyond the ominous water were reared vast cliffs, their stern faces pallid in the fading light, final and impassable. No sign of gate or entrance, not a fissure or crack could Frodo see in the frowning stone. Here are the walls of Moria, said Gandalf, pointing across the water. And there the gate stood once upon a time, the elven door at the end of the road from Holland, by which we have come. But this way is blocked. None of the company, I guess, will wish to swim in this gloomy water at the end of the day. It has an unwholesome look. Well, then we must find a way around the northern edge, said Gimli. The first thing for the company to do is to climb up the, by the main path and see where that will lead us. Even if it were no lake, we could not get our baggage pony up this stair. But in any case, we cannot take the poor beast into the mines, said Gandalf. The road under the mountain is a dark road, and there are places narrow and steep which he cannot tread, even if we can. Oh, poor old Bill, said Frodo. I had not thought of that. And poor Sam, I wonder what he will say. I am sorry, said Gandalf. Poor Bill has been a useful companion, and it goes to my heart to turn him adrift now. I would have traveled lighter and brought no animal, least of all this one that Sam is fond of, if I had it my way. I feared all along that we should be obliged to take this road. The day was drawing to its end, and cold stars were glinting in the sky above the sunset when the company, with all the speed they could, climbed up the slopes and reached the side of the lake. In breath it looked to be no more than two or three furlongs at the widest point. How far it stretched away southward they could not see in the failing light. But its northern end was no more than half a mile from where they stood, and between the stony ridges that enclosed the valley and the water's edge there was a rim of open ground. They hurried forward for they had still a mile or two to go before they could reach the point of the far shore that Gandalf was making for, and then he had still to find the doors. When they came to the northernmost corner of the lake, they found a narrow creek that barred their way. 
It was green and stagnant, thrust out like a slimy arm towards the enclosing hills. Gimli strode forward undeterred and found that the water was shallow, no more than ankle deep at the edge. Behind him they walked in file, threading their way with care, for under the weedy pools were sliding and greasy stones, and footing was treacherous. Frodo shuddered with disgust at the touch of the dark, unclean water on his feet, as Sam, the last of the company, led Bill up on the dry ground. On the far side there came a soft sound, a swish, followed by a plop, as if a fish had disturbed the still surface of the water. Turning quickly, they saw ripples, black edged with shadow in the waning light. Great rings were widening outwards from a point afar out in the lake. There was a bubbling noise, and then silence. The dusk deepened, and the last gleams of the sunset were veiled in cloud, and over this he passed his hands to and fro, muttering words under his breath. Then he stepped back. Look, he said, can you see anything now? The moon now shone over upon the the moon now shone upon the gray face of the rock, but they could see nothing else for a while. Then slowly on the surface, where the wizard's hands had passed, faint lines appeared, like slender veins of silver running in the stone. At first they were no more than pale as gossamer threads, so fine that they only twinkled fitfully where the moon caught them. But steadily they grew broader and clearer until their design could be guessed. At the top, as high as Gandalf could reach, was an arc of interlacing letters in an elvish character. Below, though the threads were in places blurred or broken, the outline could be seen of an anvil and a hammer surmounted by a crown with seven stars. Beneath these again were two trees, each bearing crescent moons. More clearly than all else were shown forth in the middle of the door a single star with many rays. Ah, oh, here are the emblems of Durin, cried Gimli. And there is the tree of the high elves, said Legolas. And the star of the house of Fëanor, said Gandalf. They are wrought in Ithildin that mirrors only starlight and moonlight, and sleeps until it is touched by one who speaks words now long forgotten in Middle-earth. It is long since I heard them, and I thought deeply before I could recall them to my mind. Well, what does the writing say? asked Frodo, who was trying to decipher the inscription of the Ark. On the arch. I thought I knew all the elf letters, but I cannot read these. The words are in the elven tongue of the west of Middle-earth in the Elder Days, answered Gandalf. But they do not say anything of importance to us. They say only, the doors of Durin, Lord of Moria, speak, friend, and enter. And underneath, small and faint is written, I, Navi, made them. Celebrimor of Holland drew these signs. What does that mean, speak, friend, and enter? asked Merry. That is plain enough, said Gimli. If you're a friend, you speak the password, and the doors will open, and you can enter. Yes, said Gandalf. These doors are probably governed by words. Some dwarf gates will open only at special times or for particular persons, and some have locks and keys that are needed when all the necessary times and words are known. These doors have no key. In the days of Durin, they were not secret. They usually stood open and door words sat there, but if they were shut, any who knew the opening word could speak it and pass in. At least so is it recorded, is it not, Gimli? It is, said the dwarf. But what the word was is not remembered. Narvi and his craft and all his kindred have vanished from the earth. But do you know the word, Gandalf? asked Boromir in surprise. No, said the wizard. The others looked dismayed. Only Aragorn, who knew Gandalf well, remained silent and unmoved. Then what was the use of bringing us to this accursed spot? cried Boromir, glancing back with a shudder at the dark water. You told us that you had once passed through the mines. How could that be if you did not know how to enter? The answer to your first question, Boromir, said the wizard, is that I do not know the word yet. But we shall soon see. And, he added with a glint in his eyes under his bristling brows, you may ask what is the use of my deeds when they are proved useless. As for your other question... Do you doubt my tale, or have you no wits left? I did not enter this way, I came from the east. If you wish to know, I will tell you that these doors open outwards. From the inside, you may thrust them open with your hands. From the outside, nothing will move them save the spell of command. They cannot be forced inwards. What are you going to do then? 
asked Pippin, undaunted by the wizard's bristling brows. Knock on the doors with your head, Peregrine Took, said Gandalf. But if that does not shatter them, I'm allowed a little peace from foolish questions. I will seek for the opening words. I once knew every spell in all the tongues of elves or men or orcs that was ever used for such a purpose. I can still remember ten score of them without searching in my mind, but only a few trials, I think, will be needed. And I shall not have to call on Gimli for words of the secret dwarf tongue that they teach to none. The opening words were in Elvish, like the writing on the Ark, and that seems certain. He stepped up from the rock again and lightly touched with his staff the silver star in the middle beneath the sign of the anvil. He said in a commanding voice. The silver lines faded, but the blank grey stone did not stir. Many times he repeated these words in different order or varied them. Then he tried other spells, one after another, speaking now faster and louder, now soft and slow. Then he spoke many single words of elvish speech. Nothing happened. The cliff towered into the light. The countless stairs were kindled and the wind blew cold and the doors stood fast. Again Gandalf approached the wall, and lifting up his arms, he spoke in tones of command and rising wrath. Edro! Edro! He cried, and struck the rock with his staff. Open! Open! He shouted, and followed it with the same command in every language that had ever been spoken in the west of Middle-earth. Then he threw his staff on the ground and sat down in silence. At that moment, from far off, the wind bore to their listening ears the howling of wolves. Bill the Pony started in fear, and Stam sprang to his side and whispered softly to him. Do not let him run away, said Boromir. It seems that we shall need him still, if the wolves do not find us. How I hate this foul pool. He stooped, and picking up a large stone, he cast it into the dark water. The stone vanished with a soft slap, but at the same instant there was a swish and a bubble. Great rippling rings formed on the surface out beyond where the stone had fallen, and they moved slowly towards the foot of the cliff. Why did you do that, Boromir? said Frodo. I hate this place too, and I'm afraid. I don't know of what. Not of wolves, or the dark behind the doors, but something else. I'm afraid of the pool. Don't disturb it. I wish we could get away, said Mary. Why doesn't Gandalf do something quick, said Pippin. Gandalf took no notice of them. He sat with his head bowed either in despair or in anxious thought. The mournful howling of the wolves was heard again. The ripples on the water grew and came closer. Some were already lapping on the shore. With a suddenness that startled them all, the wizard sprang to his feet. He was laughing. I have it, he cried. Of course, of course, absurdly simple, like most riddles when you see the answer. Picking up his staff, he stood before the rock and said in a clear voice, Melon! The star shone briefly and faded again. Then, silently, a great doorway was outlined, though not a crack or joint had been visible before. Slowly it divided in the middle and swung outwards, inch by inch, until both doors lay back against the wall. Through the opening a shadowy stair could be seen climbing steeply up, but beyond the lower steps the darkness was deeper than the night. The company stared in wonder. I was wrong after all, said Gandalf, and Gimli too. Mary of all people was on the right track. The opening word was inscribed on the archway all the time. The translation could have been, Say friend and enter. I had only to speak the Elvish word for friend and the doors opened. Quite simple. <laughs> ah, too simple for a learned law master in these suspicious days. Ah, oh, those were happier times. Now, let us go. He strode forward and set his foot on the lowest step. But at that moment, several things happened. Frodo felt something seize him by the ankle, and he fell with a cry. Bill the Pony gave a wild neigh of fear, and turned tail and dashed away along the lakeside into the darkness. Sam leaped after him, 
And then, hearing Frodo's cry, he ran back again, weeping and cursing. The others swung around and saw the waters of the lake seething as if a host of snakes were swimming up from the southern end. Out from the water, a long, sinuous tentacle had crawled. It was pale green and luminous and wet. Its fingered end had hold of Frodo's foot and was dragging him into the water. Sam, on his knees, was now slashing at it with a knife. The arm let go of Frodo, and Sam pulled him away, crying out for help. Twenty other arms came rippling out. The dark water boiled, and there was a hideous stench. Into the gateway! Up the stairs! Quick! shouted Gandalf, leaping back, rousing them from the horror that seemed to have rooted all but Sam to the ground where they stood. He drove them forward. They were just in time. Sam and Frodo were only a few steps up, and Gandalf had just begun to climb. When the groping tentacles withered across a narrow shore and fingered the cliff wall on the doors, one came wriggling over the threshold glistening in the starlight. Gandalf turned and paused. If he was considering what word would close the gate again from within, there was no need. Many coiling arms seized the door on either side, and with horrible strength swung them round. With a shattering echo, they slammed, and all light was lost. A noise of rendering and crashing came dully through the ponderous stone. Sam, clinging to Frodo's arm, collapsed on a step in the black darkness. Poor old Bill, he said in a choking voice. Poor old Bill, wolves and snakes. But the snakes were too much for him. I had to choose, Mr. Frodo. I had to come with you. They heard Gandalf go back down the steps and thrust his staff against the doors. There was a quiver in the stone and the stairs trembled, but the doors did not open. Well, well, said the wizard. The passage is blocked behind us now. And there is only one way out. On the border side of the mountains. I feel from the sounds that boulders have been piled up and the trees uprooted and thrown across the gate. I am sorry, for the trees were beautiful and had stood long. I felt that something horrible was near from the moment I let my foot first touch the water, said Frodo. What was the thing? Or were there many of them? I do not know, answered Gandalf, but the arms were all guided by one purpose. Something has crept or has been driven out of dark waters under the mountains. There are older and fouler things than orcs in the deep places of the world. He did not speak aloud his thought that whatever it was that dwelt in the lake, it had seized on Frodo first among the company. Boromir muttered under his breath, but the echoing stone magnified the sound to a hoarse whisper that all could hear. In the deep places of the world, and thither we are going against my wish, who will lead us now in this deadly dark? I will, said Gandalf. And Gimli shall walk with me. Follow my staff. As the wizard passed on ahead up the great steps, he held his staff aloft, and from its tip there came a faint radiance. The wide stairway was sound and undamaged. Two hundred steps they counted, broad and shallow. And at the top they found an arched passage with a level floor leading on into the dark. Let us sit and rest and have something to eat, here on the landing, since we can't find a dining room, said Frodo. He had begun to shake off the terror of the clutching arm, and suddenly he felt extremely hungry. The proposal was welcomed by all, and they all sat down on the upper steps, dim figures in the gloom. After they had eaten, Gandalf gave them each a third sip of the Miravor of Rivendell. It will not last much longer, I'm afraid, he said. But I think we will need it after the horror of that gate. And unless we have great luck, we shall need all that is left before we see the other side. Go carefully with the water, too. There are many streams in the wells in the mines, but they should not be touched. We may not have a chance of filling our skins and bottles till we come down to Dale. How long is that going to take us? Asked Frodo. I cannot say, answered Gandalf. It depends on many chances, but going straight without mishap or losing our way, we shall take three or four marches, I expect. It cannot be less than forty miles from the west door to east gate, in a direct line, and the road may wind much. 
After only a brief rest, they started on their way again, all the eager to get the journey over as quickly as possible, and were willing, as tired as they were, to go on marching still for several hours. Gandalf walked in front as before. In his left hand he held up his glimmering staff, the light of which just showed the ground before his feet. In his right he held his sword, glamdering. Behind him came Gimli, his eyes glinting in the dim light as he turned his head from side to side. Behind the dwarf walked Frodo, and he had drawn the short sword, Sting. No gleam came from the blades of Sting nor of Glamdring, and that was of some comfort. For being the work of elvish smiths in the elder days, these swords shone with a cold light, if any orcs were near at hand. Behind Frodo went Sam, and after him Legolas, and the young hobbits in Boromir. In the dark at the rear, grim and silent, walked Aragorn. The passage twisted round a few turns and then began to descend. It went steadily down for a long while before it became level once again. The air grew hot and stifling, but it was not foul. And at times they felt currents of cooler air upon their faces, issuing from the half-guessed openings in the walls. There were many of these. In the pale ray of the wizard's staff, Frodo caught glimpses of stairs and arches, and of other passages and tunnels sloping up or running steeply down, or opening blankly dark on either side. It was bewildering beyond hope of remembering. Gimli aided Gandalf very little, except by his stout courage. At least he was not, as were most of the others, troubled by the mere darkness in itself. Often the wizard consulted him at points where the choice of way was doubtful, but it was always Gandalf who had the final word. The mines of Moria were vast and intricate beyond the imagination of Gimli, Gloin's son, dwarf of the mountain race though he was. To Gandalf the far-off memories of a journey long before were now of little help, but even in the gloom and despite all windings of the road he knew whither he wished to go, and he did not falter, as long as there was a path that led towards his goal. Do not be afraid, said Aragorn. There was a pause longer than usual, and Gandalf and Gimli were whispering together. The others were crowded behind, waiting anxiously. Do not be afraid. I have been with him on many a journey, if never on one so dark and there are tales of Rivendell of greater deeds of his than, than any that I have seen. He will not go astray, if there is any path to find. He has led us here against our fears, and he will lead us out again. At whatever cost to himself, he is surer of finding the way home in blind night than the cats of Queen Baruthiel. It was well for the company that they had such a guide. They had no fuel nor any means of making torches, in the desperate scramble at the doors, many things had been left behind. Without any light, they could soon have come to grief. There were not only many roads to choose from, there were also many places, holes and pitfalls, and dark wells beside the path in which their passing feet echoed. There were fissures and chasms in the walls and floor, and every now and then a crack would open right before their feet. The widest was more than seven feet across, and it was long before Pippin could summon enough courage to leap over the dreadful gap. The noise of churning water came up from far below, as if some great mill wheel was turning in the depths. Rope, muttered Sam. I knew I'd want it if I hadn't got it. As these dangers became more frequent, their march became slower. Already they seemed to have been tramping on, on endlessly into the mountain's roots. They were more than weary. And yet there seemed no comfort in the thought of halting anywhere. Frodo's spirits had risen for a while after his escape, and after food and a draught of the cordial, but now a deep uneasiness, growing to dread, crept over him again. Though he had been healed in Rivendell of the knife-stroke, that grim wound had not been without effect. His senses were sharper and more aware of things that could not be seen. One sight of change that he soon had noticed was that he could see more in the dark than any of his companions, save perhaps Gandalf. And he was in any case the bearer of the ring. It hung upon his chain against his breast, and at whiles it seemed a heavy weight. He felt the certainty of evil ahead and of evil following, but he said nothing. 
He gripped tighter on the hilt of his sword and went on doggedly. The company behind him spoke seldom, and then only in hurried whispers. There was no sound but of the sound of their own feet, the dull stump of Gimli's dwarf boots, the heavy tread of Boromir, the light step of Legolas, the soft, scarce-heard patter of hobbit feet, and in the rear the slow, firm footfalls of Aragorn with his long stride. When they halted for a moment, they heard nothing at all, unless it were occasionally a faint trickle and drip of unseen water. Yet Frodo began to hear, or to imagine that he heard, something else. Like the faint fall of soft bare feet, it was never loud enough or near enough for him to feel certain that he heard it, but once it had started it had never stopped while the company was moving. But it was not an echo, for when they halted, it pattered on for a little all by itself, and then grew still. It was after nightfall when they had entered the mines. They had been going for several hours with only brief halts, when Gandalf came to his first serious check. Before him stood a wide dark arch, opening into three passages. All led in the same general direction, eastwards, but the left-hand passage plunged down, while the right hand climbed up, and the middle way seemed to run on, smooth and level, but very narrow. I have no memory of this place at all, said Gandalf, standing uncertainly under the arch. He held up his staff in the hope of finding some marks or inscription that might help his choice, but nothing of the kind was to be seen. I am too weary to decide, he said, shaking his head. And I expect that you are all weary as I am, or earlier. We had better halt here before what is left of the night. You know what I mean. In here it is ever dark, but outside the late moon is riding westward, and the middle night has passed. Poor old Bill, said Sam. I wonder where he is. I hope those wolves haven't gotten yet. To the left of the great arch they found a stone door. It was half closed, but swung back easily to a gentle thrust. Beyond there seemed to lie a wide chamber cut in the rock. Steady, steady, cried Gandalf as Merry and Pippin pushed forward, glad to find a place where they could rest with at least some feeling of shelter than in the open passage. Steady, you do not know what is inside yet. I will go first. He went in cautiously, and the others filed behind. There, he said, pointing with his staff to the middle of the floor. Before his feet they saw a large round hole like the mouth of a well. Broken and rusty chains lay at the edge and trailed down to the black pit. Fragments of stone lay near. One of you might have fallen in and still be wondering when you are going to strike the bottom, said Aragorn to Merry. Let the guide go first while you have one. Said Gimli. That hole was plainly a well for the guard's use, covered with a stone lid. But the lid is broken. We must all take care in the dark. Pippin felt curiously attached by the well. While the others were unrolling blankets and making beds against the walls of the chamber, as far as possible from the hole in the floor, he crept to the edge and peered over. A chill air seemed to strike his face, rising from invisible depths. Moved by a sudden impulse, he groped for a loose stone and let it drop. He felt his heart beat many times before there was any sound. Then far below... As if the stone had fallen into deep water in some cavernous place, there came a plonk, very distant, but magnified and repeated in the hollow shaft. What's that? cried Gandalf. He was relieved when Pippin confessed what he had done, but he was angry, and Pippin could see his eye glinting. Fool of the duke, he growled. This is a serious journey, not a hobbit walking party. Throw yourself in next time, and then you will be of no further usance. Now be quiet. Nothing more was heard for several minutes, but then there came out of the depths faint knocks. Tom, tap, tap, tom. They stopped. And when the echoes had died away, they were repeated. Tap, tom, tom, tap, 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 tom. They sounded disquietly like signals of some sort, 
But after a while, the knocking died away and was not heard again. That was the sound of a hammer, or I have never heard one, said Gimli. Yes, said Gandalf, and I do not like it. It may have nothing to do with Peregrine's foolish stone, but probably something has been disturbed that would have been better left quiet. Pray do nothing of the kind again. Let us hope that we shall get some rest without further trouble. You, Pippin, can go on the first watch, Sir Lord. He growled as he rolled himself in a blanket. Pippin sat miserably by the door in the pitch dark, but he kept on turning round, feeling that some unknown thing would crawl up from out of the well. He wished he could cover the hole, if only with a blanket, but he dared not move. Or go near it, even though Gandalf seemed to be asleep. Actually, Gandalf was awake, though lying still and silent. He was deep in thought, trying to recall every memory of his former journey in the mines, and considering anxiously the next course that he should take. A false turn now might be disastrous. After an hour, he rose up, and came over to Pippin. Get into a corner and have a sleep, my lad, he said in a kindly tone. You won't sleep, I expect. I cannot get a wink, so I may as well do the watching. I know what is the matter with me, he muttered, as he sat down by the door. I need a smoke. I have not tasted it since the morning before the snowstorm. The last thing that Pippin saw, as sleep took him, was a dark glimpse of the old wizard huddled on the floor, shielding a glowing chip in his gnarled hands between his knees. The flicker for a moment showed his sharp nose, and the puff of smoke. It was Gandalf who roused them all from sleep. He had sat and watched all alone for about six hours, and had let the others rest. And in the watches I have made up my mind, he said. I do not like the feel of the middle way, and I do not like the smell of the left-hand way. There is a foul air down there, or I am no guide. I shall take the right-hand passage. It is time we began to climb up again. For eight dark hours, not counting two brief halts, they marched on, and they met no danger and heard nothing, and saw nothing but the faint gleam of the wizard's light, bobbing like a will-o'-the-wisp in front of them. The passage they had chosen wound steadily upwards. As far as they could judge, it went in great mounding curves, and as it rose it grew loftier and wider. There were now no openings to other galleries or tunnels on either side, and the floor was level and sound, without pits or cracks. Evidently they had struck what once had been an important road, and they went forward quicker than they had done on their first march. In this way they advanced some fifteen miles, measured in a direct line east, though they must have actually walked twenty miles or more. As the road climbed upwards Frodo's spirits rose a little, but he still felt oppressed, and still at times he heard, or thought he heard, away behind the company and beyond the fall, a patter of their feet, a following footstep that was not an echo. They had marched as far as the hobbits could endure without a rest, and all were thinking of a place where they could sleep. When suddenly the walls to right and left vanished, they seemed to have passed through some arched doorway into a black and empty space. There was a great draught of warmer air behind them, and before them the darkness was cold on their faces. They halted and crowded anxiously together. Gandalf seemed pleased. I chose the right way, he said. At last we are coming to the habitable parts, and I guess that we are not far now from the eastern side. But we are high up, a good deal higher than the Dimbril Gate, unless I am mistaken. From the feeling of the air we must be in a wide hall. I will now risk a little real light. He raised his staff, and for a brief instant there was a blaze like a flash of lightning. Great shadows sprang up and fled, and for a second they saw a vast roof far above their heads, upheld by many mighty pillars hewn of stone. Before them and on either side stretched a huge empty hall, its black walls, polished and smooth as glass, flashed and glittered. 
Three other entrances they saw, dark black arches, one straight before them eastward and one on either side. Then the light went out. That is all that I shall venture on for the present, said Gandalf. There used to be great windows on the mountainside, and shafts leading out to the light in the upper reaches of the mines. I think we have reached them now, but it is night outside again, and we cannot tell until morning. If I am right, tomorrow we may actually see the morning peeping in. But in the meanwhile, we had better go on no further. Let us rest if we can. Things have gone well so far, and the greater part of the dark road is over. But we are not through yet, and it is a long way down to the gates that open to the world. The company spent that night in the great cavernous hall, huddled close together in a corner to escape the draught. There seemed to be a steady inflow of chill air through the eastern archway. All about them as they lay hung in the darkness, hollow and immense, and they were all oppressed by the loneliness and vastness of the dolven holes and endlessly branching stairs and passages. The wildest imaginings that dark rumour had ever suggested to the hobbits fell altogether short of the actual dread and wonder of Moria. said Sam. Said Gimli. This is the great realm and city of the Dwarrow Delf, and of old it was not darksome, but full of light and splendor, as is still remembered in our songs. <clears throat> He rose, and standing in the dark he began to chant in a deep voice, while the echoes ran away into the roof. The world was young, the mountains green. No strain yet on moon was seen. No words were lain on stream or stone, when Durin woke and walked alone. He named the nameless hills and dells. He drank from yet untasted wells. He stooped and looked in. Mirror, mirror, and saw a crown of stars appear, as gems upon a silver thread, above the shadow of his head. The world was fair, the mountains tall, in elder days before the fall, of mighty kings in Argothrond, and Gondolin, who now beyond the western seas have passed away. The world was fair in Durin's day. A king he was on carven throne, in many pillared halls of stone, with golden roof and silver floor, and runes of power upon the door, the light of sun and star and moon, in shining lamps of crystal hewn, undimmed by cloud or shade of night. There shone forever fair and bright. There hammer on the anvil smote. There chisel clove and graver wrote. There forged was blade and bound was hilt. The delver mine the mason built. There burial pearl and opal pale, and metal wrought like fish's mail. Buckler and corslet, axe and sword, and shining spears were laid in hoard. Unwearied then were Durin's folk, beneath the mountain's music woke. The harpers harped, the minstrels sang, and at the gates the trumpets rang. The world is grey, the mountains old, the forge's fire is ashen cold. No sharp is rung, no hammer falls. The darkness dwells in Durin's halls. The shadow lies upon his tomb. In Moria, in Khazad Doom. But still in sunken stars appear. In dark and windless mirror mirror, there lies his crown in water deep. Till Durin wakes again from sleep. Said Sam.
Gimli was silent. Having sung his song, he would say no more. Piles of jewels, said Gandalf. No, the orcs have often plundered Moria. There is nothing left in the upper halls, and since the dwarves fled, no one dares to seek the shafts and treasuries down in the deep places. They are drowned in water, or in a shadow of fear. Asked Sam. For Mithril, answered Gandalf. The wealth of Moria was not in gold and jewels, the toys of the dwarves, nor in iron, their servant. Such things they found here, it is true, especially iron, but they did not need to delve for them. All things that they desired they could obtain in traffic, for here alone in the world was found Moria silver, or true silver as some have called it. Mithril is the elvish name. The dwarves have a name which they do not tell. Its worth was ten times that of gold. And now it is beyond price, for little is left above ground, and even the orcs dare not delve here for it. The loads lead away north towards Caradras, and down to darkness. The dwarves tell no tale, but even as Mithril was the foundation of their wealth, so also it was their destruction. They delve too greedily and too deep, and disturb that from which they fled. Durin Spain. Of what they brought to light, the orcs have gathered nearly all, and given it tribute to Sauron, who covets it. Mithril, all folk desired it. It could be beaten like copper and polished like glass, and the dwarves could make of it a metal, light and yet harder than tempered steel. Its beauty was like that of the common silver, but the beauty of Mithril did not tarnish or grow dim. The elves dearly loved it, and among many uses they made of it Ithildin, Star Moon, which you saw upon the doors. Bilbo had a corset of Mithril rings that Thorin gave him. I wonder what has become of it, gathering dust still in Mikkeldelvig Matham House, I suppose. What? cried Gimli, startled out of his silence. A corset of Moria Silver! That was a kingly gift. Yes, said Gandalf. I never told him, but its worth was greater than the value of the whole shire and everything in it. Frodo said nothing, but he put his hand under his tunic and touched the rings of his mail shirt. He felt staggered to think that he had been walking about with the price of the shire under his jacket. Had Bilbo known? He felt no doubt that Bilbo knew quite well. It was indeed a kingly gift. But now his thoughts had been carried away from the dark mines to Rivendell, to Bilbo, and to Bag End, in the days while Bilbo was still there. He wished with all his heart that he was back there, and in those days, mowing the lawn, or pottering among the flowers, and that he had never heard of Moria, or Mithril, or the Ring. A deep silence fell. One by one the others fell asleep. Frodo was on guard. As if it were a breath that came through the unseen doors out of deep places, dread came over him. His hands were cold and his brow damp. He listened. All his mind was given to listening and nothing else for two slow hours, but he heard no sound, not even the imagined echo of a footfall. His watch was nearly over, when far off, where he guessed that the western archway stood, he fancied what he could see two pale points of light, almost like luminous eyes. He started. His head had nodded. I must have nearly fallen asleep on guard, he thought. I was on the edge of a dream. He stood up and rubbed his eyes, and remained standing, peering into the dark, until he was relieved by Legolas. When he lay down, he quickly went to sleep, but it seemed to him that the dream went on. He heard whispers, and saw the two pale points of light approaching, slowly. He woke and found that the others were speaking softly near him, and that a dim light was falling on his face. High up above the eastern archway, through a shaft near the roof, came a long pale gleam, and across the hall, through the northern arch, light also glimmered faint and distantly. Frodo sat up. Good morning, said Gandalf. A morning it is again at last. I was right, you see. 
We are high up on the eastern side of Moria. Before today is over, we ought to find the great gates and see the waters of Miramir lying in the dim little dale before us. <laughs> I shall be glad, said Gimli. I have looked on Moria, and it is very great. But it has become dark and dreadful. And we have found no sign of my kindred. So I doubt now that Barlin ever came here. After they had breakfasted, Gandalf decided to go on again at once. We are tired, but we shall rest better when we are outside, he said. I think that none of us will wish to spend another night in Moria. No, indeed, said Boromir. Which way shall we take? Yonder eastward arch? Maybe, said Gandalf, but I do not know yet exactly where we are, unless I am quite astray. I guess that we are above and to the north of the great gates, and it may not be easy to find the right road down to them. The eastern arch would probably prove to be the way that we must take, but before we make up our minds, we ought to look about us. Let us go towards that light in the north door. If we could find a window, it would help, but I fear that the light comes only down deep shafts. Following his lead, the company passed under the northern arch. They found themselves in a wide corridor. As they went along it, the grimmer grew stronger, and they saw that it came through a doorway on their right. It was high and flat-topped, and the stone door was still upon its hinges, standing half open. Beyond it was a large square chamber. It was dimly lit, but to their eyes, after so long a time in the dark, it seemed dazzlingly bright, and they blinked as they entered. Their feet disturbed a deep dust upon the floor, and stumbled upon things lying in the doorway whose shapes they could not at first make out. The chamber was lit by a wide shaft high in the further eastern wall. It slanted upwards, and, far above, a small square patch of blue sky could be seen. The light of the shaft fell directly on a table in the middle of the room, a single oblong block, about two feet high, upon which was laid a great slab of white stone. It looks like a tomb, muttered Frodo, and, and bent forwards with a curious sense of foreboding to look more closely at it. Gandalf came quickly to his side. On the slab ruins were deeply graven. These are Daron's ruins, such as were used of old in Moria, said Gandalf. Here is written in the tongues of men and dwarves. Barlin, son of Fundin, lord of Moria. He is dead then, said Frodo. I feared it was so. Gimli cast his hood over his face. The company of the ring stood silent beside the tomb of Balin. Frodo thought of Bilbo and his long friendship with the dwarf, and of Balin's visit to the Shire long ago. In that dusty chamber in the mountains it seemed a thousand years ago, and on the other side of the world. At length they stirred and looked up, and began to search for anything that would give them the tidings of Balin's fate, or show that what had become of his folk. There was another smaller door on the other side of the chamber, under the shaft. By both the doors they could now see that many bones were lying, and among them were broken swords and axe-heads and cloven shields and helms. Some of the swords were crooked, orc scimitars with blackened blades. There were many recesses cut in the rock of the walls, and in them were large iron-bound chests of wood. All had been broken and plundered, but beside the shattered lid of one there lay the remains of a book. It had been slashed and stabbed and partly burned, and it was so stained with black and other dark marks like old blood that little of it could be read. Gandalf lifted it carefully, but the leaves crackled and broke as he laid it on the slab. He pored over it for some time without speaking. Frodo and Gimli standing at his side could see as he gingerly turned the leaves that they were written by many different hands in runes, both of Moria and of Dale, and here and there in Elvish script. At last Gandalf looked up. It seems to be a record of the fortunes of Balin's folk, he said. I guess that it began with their coming to Dimron Dale nigh on thirty years ago. The pages seem to have numbers referring to the years after their arrival. The top page is marked one, three, so at least two are missing from the beginning. Listen to this. We drove out orcs from the great gate and guard, I think. 
The next word is blurred and burned. Probably room. We slew many in the bright, I think, sun in the dale. Floy was killed by an arrow. He slew the great. Then there is a blur followed by Floy under grass near Mirror Mirror. The next line or two I cannot read. Then comes, we have taken the twenty-first hole of North End to dwell in. There is, I cannot read what. A shaft is mentioned. Then Barlin has set up his seat in the chamber of Mazarbul. The chamber of records, said Gimli. I guess that is where we now stand. Well, I can read no more for a long way, said Gandalf. Except the word gold, and Durin's axe, and something helm. Then, Barlin is now lord of Moria. That seems to end the chapter. After some stars, another hand begins, and I can see we found true silver, and later the word well forged, and then something. Uh, I have it, Mithril, and the last two lines Oin to seek for the upper armories of Third Deep, something go westwards, a blur to Holland Gate. Gandalf paused and set a few leaves aside. There are several pages of the same sort, rather hastily written, some damaged, he said. But I can make little of them in this light. Ah, there must be a number of leaves missing because they begin to be numbered five. The fifth year of the colony, I suppose. Let me see. No, no, they are too cut and stained. I cannot read them. We might do better in the sunlight. Wait, there is something. A large, bold hand using an elvish script. That would be Orin's hand, said Gimli, looking over the wizard's arm. He could write well and speedily, and often use the elvish characters. I fear he had ill tidings to record in that fair hand, said Gandalf. The first clear word is sorrow, but the rest of the line is lost unless it ends in Esther. Yes, it must be Yester, followed by Day, being the 10th of November, Barlin, Lord of Moria fell. In Dimril Dale. He went alone to look in Miramir. An orc shot him from behind a stone. We slew the orc, but many more up from east up the silver load. The remainder of the page is so blurred that I can hardly make anything out. But I think I can read We have barred the gates, and then can hold them long if. And then perhaps horrible and suffer. Poor Parlin. He seems to have kept the title that he took for less than five years. I wonder what happened afterwards. But there is no time to puzzle out the last few pages. Here is the last page of all. He paused and sighed. This is grim reading, he said. I fear their end was cruel. Listen, we cannot get out, we cannot get out, they have taken the bridge and the second hall, Frar and Loni and Nali fell there, and then there are four lines smeared so I can only read, went five days ago, the last lines run, the pool is up to the wall at Westgate, the watcher in the water took Oin. We cannot get out. The end comes. And then, drums, drums in the deep. I wonder what it means. The last thing written is a trailing scroll of elf letters. They are coming. There is nothing more. Gandalf paused and stood in silent thought. A sudden dread and horror of the chamber fell on the company. Muttered Gimli. It was well for us that the pool had sunk a little, and that the water was sleeping down at the southern end. Gandalf raised his head and looked around. 
They seem to have made a last stand by both doors, he said. But there were not many left by that time. So ended the attempt to meet the It was valiant, but foolish. The time is not come yet. Now, I fear, we must say farewell to Balin, son of Fundin. Here he must lie in the halls of his fathers. We will take his book, the Book of Mazarbul, and look at it more closely later. You had better keep it, Gimli, and take it back to Dagon, if you get the chance. It will interest him, though. It will grieve him deeply. Come, let us go. The morning is passing. Asked Boromir. All, answered Gandalf. But our visit to this room had not been in vain. I now know where we are. This must be, as Gimli says, the chamber of Mazarbul. And the hall must be the twenty-first of the north end. Therefore we should leave by the eastern arch of the hall, and bear right and south, and go downwards. The twenty-first hall should be on the seventh level. That is six above the level of the gates. Come now. Back to the hall. Gandalf had hardly spoken these words when there came a great noise. A rolling boom that seemed to come from the depths far below and to tremble in the stone at their feet. They sprang towards the door in alarm. Doom, doom, it rolled again, as if huge hands were turning the very caverns of Moria into a vast drum. Then there came an echoing blast. A great horn was blown in the hole, and answering horns and harsh cries were heard further off. There was a hurrying sound of many feet. They are coming! cried Legolas. We cannot get out! cried Gimli. Trapped! cried Gandalf. Why did I delay? Here we are, caught just as they were before. And I was not here then. We shall see what. Doom, doom came the drum beat and the walls shook. Slam the doors and wait there! shouted Aragorn. And keep your packs on as long as you can. We may get a chance to get our way out yet. Hurr! said Gandalf. We must not get shut in. Keep the east door ajar. We will go that way if we get a chance. Another harsh horn call and shrill cries rang out. Feet were coming down the corridor. There was a ring and clatter as the company drew their swords. Glamdring shone in a pale light, and sting glinted at the edges. Boromir set his shoulder against the western door. Wait a moment. Don't close it here. Said Gandalf. He sprang forward to Boromir's side and drew himself up to his full height. Who comes hither to disturb the rest of Balin, Lord of Moria? He cried in a loud voice. There was a rush of hoarse laughter, like the fall of sliding stones into a pit. Amid the clamor, a deep voice was raised in command. Doom, doom, doom went the drums in the deep. With a quick movement, Gandalf stepped before the narrow opening of the door and thrust forward his staff. There was a dazzling flash that lit the chamber in the passage outside. For an instant, the wizard looked out. Arrows whined and whistled down the corridor as he sprang back. There are orcs, many of them, he said, and some are large and evil, black rooks of Mordor. For the moment, they are hanging back, but there is something else there. A great cave troll, I think. Or more than one. There is no hope of escape that way. Said Boromir. There is no sound outside here yet said Aragorn, who was standing by the eastern door listening. The passage on this side plunges straight down a stair. It plainly does not lead back towards the hall, but it is no good flying blindly this way, with the pursuit just behind. We cannot block the door. Its key is gone and the lock is broken, and it opens inwards. We must do something to delay the enemy first. <laughs> we will make them fear the chamber of Mazarbul, he said firmly, feeling the edge of his sword, Anduril. Heavy feet were heard in the corridor. Boromir flung himself against the door and heaved it too. Then he wedged it with broken sword blades and splinters of wood. The company retreated to the other side of the chamber. But they had no chance to fly yet. There was a blow on the door that made it quiver. And then it began to grind slowly open, driving back the wedges. A huge arm and shoulder with a dark skin of greenish scales was thrust through the widening gap. Then a great, flat, toeless foot was forced through below. There was dead silence outside. Boromir leaped forward and hewed at the arm with all his might. His sword rang, glanced aside, and fell from his shaken hand. The blade was notched. 
Suddenly, and to his own surprise, Frodo felt a hot wrath blaze up in his heart. And springing beside Boromir, he stooped and stabbed with sting the hideous foot. There was a bellow, and the foot jerked back, nearly wrenching sting from Frodo's arm. Black drops dripped from the blade and smoked on the floor. Boromir hurled himself against the door and slammed it again. Cried Aragorn. The hobbit's bite is deep. You have a good blade, Frodo, son of Drogo. There was a crash on the door, followed by crash after crash. Rams and hammers were beating against it. It cracked and staggered back, and the opening grew suddenly wide. Arrows came whistling in, but struck the northern wall and fell harmlessly to the floor. There was a horn blast and a rush of feet, and orcs one after another leaped into the chamber. How many there were the company could not count. The affray was sharp, but the orcs were dismayed by the fierceness of the defense. Legolas shot two through the throat. Gimli hewed the legs from under another that had sprung up on Balin's tomb. Boromir and Aragorn slew many. When thirteen had fallen, the rest fled shrieking, leaving the defenders unharmed, except for Sam, who had a scratch along the sky. A fire was smoldering in his brown eyes that would have made ten sandy men step backwards if he had seen it. Now is the time! cried Gandalf. Push down before the troll returns! But even as they retreated and before Pippin and Merry had reached the stair outside, a huge orc chieftain, almost man-high, clad in black mail from head to foot, leaped into the chamber. Behind him his followers clustered in the doorway. His broad, flat face was swart, his eyes were like coals, and his tongue was red. He wielded a great spear. With a thrust of his huge hide shield, he turned Boromir's sword and bore him backwards, throwing him to the ground. Diving under Aragorn's blow with the speed of a striking snake, he charged into the company and thrust his spear straight at Frodo. And Frodo was hurled against the wall and pinned. Sam, with a cry, hacked at the spear shaft and it broke. But even as the orc flung down the truncheon and swept out his scimitar, Anduril came down upon his helm. There was a flash like flame and the helm burst asunder. The orc fell with cloven head. His followers fled howling as Boromir and Aragorn sprang at them. Went the drums in the deep. The great voice rolled out again. No! shouted Gandalf. Now is the chance! Run for it! Aragorn picked up Frodo where he lay by the wall and made for the stair, pushing Merry and Pippin in front of him. The others followed, but Gimli had to be dragged away by Legolas. In spite of the peril, he lingered by Balin's tomb with his head bowed. Boromir hauled the eastern door too, grinding upon its hinges. It had great iron rings on either side, but could not be fastened. I'm all right. I'm all right, gasped Frodo. I can walk. Put me down. Aragorn nearly dropped him in his amazement. I thought you were dead, he cried. Not yet, said Gandalf, but there is no time to wonder. Off you go, and all of you down the stairs. Wait a few minutes for me at the bottom. But if I do not come soon, go on. Go quickly, choosing paths, leading right and downwards. We can't leave you to the door alone, said Aragorn. Where is our son? said Gandalf fiercely. Swords are no more use here. Go! The passage was lit by no shaft and was utterly dark. They groped their way down a long flight of steps and then looked back. But they could see nothing, except high above them the faint glimmer of the wizard's staff. He seemed to be still standing on guard by the closed door. Frodo breathed heavily and leaned against Sam, who put his arms around him. They stood peering up the stairs into the darkness. Frodo thought he could hear the voice of Gandalf above, muttering words that ran down the sloping roof with a sighing echo. He could not catch what was said. The walls seemed to be trembling. Every now and again the drum beats throbbed and rolled. Doom, doom. Suddenly at the top of the stair there was a stab of white light. Then there was a dull rumble and a heavy thud. The drum beats broke out wildly. Doom, boom, doom, boom and then stopped. Gandalf came flying down the steps and fell to the ground in the midst of the company. Well, well, that's over, said the wizard, struggling to his feet. I have done all that I could. I have met my match, and have nearly been destroyed. But don't stand there. Go on. You have to do without light for a while. I am rather shaken. Go on. Where are you, Gimli? 
Come ahead with me. Keep close behind, all of you. They stumbled after him, wondering what had happened. Doom, doom went the drum beats again. They now sounded muffled and far away, but they were moving. There was no other sound of pursuit, neither tramp of feet, nor any voice. Gandalf took no turns, right or left, for the passage seemed to be going in the direction that he desired. Every now and again, it descended a flight of steps, fifty or more, to a lower level. At the moment, that was their chief danger, for in the dark they could not see a descent, until they came on it and put their feet out into emptiness. Gandalf felt the ground with his staff like a blind man. At the end of an hour, they had gone a mile, or maybe a little more, and had descended many flights of stairs. There was still no sound of pursuit. Almost they began to hope that they would escape. At the bottom of the seventh flight, Gandalf halted. It's getting hot, he gasped. We ought to be down at least on the level of the gates now. Soon I think we should look for a left-hand turn to take us east. I hope it's not far. I'm very wary. I must rest here a moment. Even if all the orcs ever spawned are after us. Gimli took his arm and helped him down to a seat on the step. What happened up at the door? He asked. Did you meet the beaten of the drums? I do not know, answered Gandalf. But I found myself suddenly faced by something that I have not met before. I could think of nothing to do but to try to put a shutting spell on the door. I know many. But doing things of that kind rightly requires time, and even then the door can be broken by strength. As I stood there, I could hear orc voices on the other side. At any moment I thought they would burst it open. I could not hear what was said. They seemed to be talking in their own hideous language. All I caught was gash. That is fire. Then something came into the chamber. I felt it through the door, and the orcs themselves were afraid and fell silent. It laid hold on the iron ring, and then it perceived me and my spell. What it was I cannot guess, but I have never felt such a challenge. The counter spell was terrible, it nearly broke me. For an instant the door left my control and began to open. I had to speak a word of command. That proved too great a strain. The door burst in pieces, something dark as a cloud was blocking all the light inside and I was thrown backwards down the stairs all the wall gave way and the roof of the chamber as well I think I'm afraid Barlin is buried deep and maybe something else is buried there too I cannot say but at least the passage behind us was completely blocked oh, I have never felt so spent but it is passing now what about you Frodo? There was not time to say so, but I have never been more delighted in my life when I heard you spoke. I fear that it was a brave but dead hobbit that Aragorn was carrying. Well, said Aragorn, I can only say that hobbits are made of stuff so tough that I have never met the like of it. Had I known I would have spoken softer in the inn and brie, that spear thrust would have skewered a wild boar. Said Frodo. He said no more. He found breathing painful. You take after Bilbo, said Gandalf. There is more about you that beats the eye, as I said a block ago. Frodo wondered if the remark meant more than it said. They now went on again. Before long, Gimli spoke. He had keen eyes in the dark. I think, she said, that there is a light ahead, but it is not daylight. It is better. Muttered Gandalf. Soon the light became unmistakable and could be seen by all. It was flickering and glowing on the walls away down the passage before them. They could now see their way. In front the road sloped down swiftly, and some way ahead there stood a low archway. Through it the growing light came. The air became very hot. When they came to the arch, Gandalf went through, signing to them to wait. As he stood just beyond the opening, they saw his face lit by a red glow. 
Quickly, he stepped back. There is some new devilry here, he said. The fires for our welcome, no doubt. But I know now where we are. We have reached the first deep in the level immediately below the gates. This is the second hall of old Moria, and the gates are near, away beyond the eastern end on the left. Not more than a quarter of a mile, across the bridge, up a broad stair, along a wide road, through the first hall, and out. But come and look. They peered out. Before them was another cavernous hall. It was loftier and far longer than the one in which they had slept. They were near its eastern end. Westward it ran away into darkness. Down the center stalked a double line of towering pillars. They were carved like bows of mighty trees, whose bows upheld the roof with a branching tracery of stone. Their stems were smooth and black, but a red glow was darkly mirrored in their sides. Right across the floor, close to the feet of two huge pillars, a great fissure had opened. Out of it, a fierce red light came, and now and again flames licked at the brink and curled about the bases of the columns. Wisps of dark smoke wavered in the hot air. If we had come by the main road down to the upper halls, we should have been trapped here, said Gandalf. Let us hope that the fire now lies between us and pursuit. Come! There is no time to lose! Even as they spoke, they heard again the pursuing drum beat. Do, do, do. Away beyond the shadows at the western end of the hall, there came cries and horn calls. Do, do. The pillars seemed to tremble and the flames to quiver. Now for the last race, said Gandalf. The sun is shining outside, we may still escape. After me! He turned left and sped across the smooth floor of the hall. The distance was greater than it had looked. As they ran, they heard the beat and echo of many hurrying feet behind. A shrill yell went up. They had been seen. There was a ring of clash of steel. An arrow whistled over Frodo's head. Boromir laughed. He said, Called Gandalf. The bridge is there. It is dangerous and never. Suddenly Frodo saw before him a black chasm. At the end of the hall, the floor vanished and fell to an unknown depth. The outer door could only be reached by a slender bridge of stone, without curb or rail, that spanned the chasm with one curving spring of fifty feet. It was an ancient defense of the dwarves against any enemy that might capture the first hall and the outer passengers. They could only pass across a single file. At the brink, Gandalf halted, and the others came up in a pack behind. Either way, Gimli, he said. Give it a many necks, straight on, and up the stair, beyond the door. Arrows fell among them. One struck Frodo and sprang back. Another pierced Gandalf's hat and stuck there like a black feather. Frodo looked behind. Beyond the fire, he saw swarming black figures. There seemed to be hundreds of orcs. They brandished spears and scimitars, which shone red as blood in the firelight. Boom, boom, rolled the drum beats, blowing louder and louder. Legolas turned and set an arrow to the string, though it was a long shot for his small bow. He drew, but then his hand fell, and the arrow slipped to the ground. He gave a cry of dismay and fear. Two great trolls appeared. They bore great slabs of stone and flung them down to serve as gangways over the fire. But it was not the trolls that had filled the elf with terror. The ranks of the orcs had opened, and they crowded away as if they themselves were afraid. Something was coming up behind them. What it was could not be seen. It was like a great shadow, in the middle of which was a dark form. Of man-shape, maybe, yet greater. And a power and terror seemed to be in it, and go before it. It came to the edge of the fire, and the light faded as if a cloud had bent over it. Then with a rush it leaped across the fissure. The flames roared up to greet it, and wreathed about it, and the black smoke swirled in the air. Its streaming mane kindled and blazed behind it. In its right hand was a blade like a stabbing tongue of fire, and in its left it held a whip of many thongs. Hi! Hi! A Balrog! A Balrog has come! Gimli stared with wide eyes. Do 
fool it's been! He cried, letting the axe fall. He covered his face. A Balrog, muttered Gandalf. Now I understand. He faltered and leaned heavily on his staff. What an evil fortune. And I am already weary. The dark figure streaming with fire raced towards them. The orbs yelled and poured over the stone gangways. Then Boromir raised his horn and blew. Loud the challenge rang and bellowed, like the shout of many throats under the cavernous roof. For a moment the orcs quailed and the fiery shadow halted. Then the echoes died as suddenly as a flame blown out by a dark wind, and the enemy advanced again. Over the bridge! cried Gandalf, recalling his strength. Fly! This is a foe beheld any of you! I was holding that away! Fly! Aragorn and Boromir did not heed the command, but still held their ground, side by side, behind Gandalf at the far end of the bridge. The others halted just within the doorway at the hall's end, and turned, unable to leave their leader to face the enemy alone. The Balrog reached the bridge. Gandalf stood in the middle of the span, leaning on the staff in his left hand, but in his other hand Glandring gleamed, cold and white. His enemy halted again, facing him, and the shadow about it reached out like two vast wings. It raised the whip, and the thongs whined and cracked. The fire came from its nostrils, but Gandalf stood firm. You cannot pass, he said. The orcs stood still, and a dead silence fell. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor. You cannot pass! The dark fire will not avail you! Flame of Altoon! Go back to the shadow! You cannot pass! He said. The orcs stood still. The Balrog made no answer. The fire then seemed to die, but the darkness grew. It stepped forward slowly onto the bridge, and suddenly it threw itself into a great height, and its wings were spread from wall to wall. But still Gandalf could be seen, glimmering in the gloom. He seemed small, and altogether alone, grey and bent, like a wizened tree before the onset of the storm. From out of the shadow a red sword leaped flaming. Dandry glittered white in answer. There was a real flash and a stab of white fire. The barrel fell back and its sword flew up in molten fragments. The wizard swayed on the bridge, stepped back a pace, and then again stood still. You cannot pass! He said. With a bound, the Balrog leaped full upon the bridge. Its wit whirled and hissed. Cried Aragorn suddenly, and ran back along the bridge. Helendil! He shouted. I am with you, Gandalf! Cried Boromir and leaped after him. At that moment, Gandalf lifted his staff, and crying aloud, he smote the bridge before him. The staff broke asunder and fell from his hand. A blinding sheet of white flame sprang up. The bridge cracked. Right at the Balrog's feet it broke, and the stone upon which it stood crashed into the gulf, while the rest remained, poised, quivering like a tongue of rock thrust out into emptiness. With a terrible cry, the Balrog fell forward, and its shadow plunged down and vanished. But even as it fell, it swung its whip, and the tongs lashed, and curled about the wizard's knees, dragging him into the brink. He staggered and fell, grasped vainly at the stone, and slid into the abyss. He cried and was gone. The fires went out and blank darkness fell. The company stood rooted with horror, staring into the pit. Even as Aragorn and Boromir came flying back, the rest of the bridge cracked and fell. With a cry, Aragorn roused them. Come! I will lead you now! He called. We must obey his last command. Follow me! They stumbled wildly up the great stairs beyond the door, Aragorn leading, Boromir at the rear, 
At the top was a wide echoing passage. Along this they fled. Frodo heard Sam at his side weeping, and then he found that he himself was weeping as he ran. Doom, doom, doom. The drumbeats rolled behind, mournful now and slow. They ran on. The light grew before them. Great shafts pierced the roof. They ran swifter. They passed into a hall, bright with daylight from its high windows in the east. They fled across it. Through its huge broken doors they passed, and suddenly before them the great gates opened, an arc of blazing light. There was a guard of orcs 